All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, my name is John Reese. I'm gonna be talking to you about our company's approach to policy um, coming from a very role-heavy focused security model. Um, so again, name is John Reese. I work at Plex, the manufacturing cloud. I get that a lot, we're not the media server. Um, we are actually a ERP system for manufacturers, uh, enterprise resource planning. So we handle anything from the shop floor all the way to the CEO. So think shipping, accounting, their, their HR system, anything they need to do to run their business, that's kind of our wheelhouse. Um, I also love the Go programming language. So if you love Go, then we're already best of friends and we should hang out sometime. So again, this is really gonna be how we have approached security over the years. The company's been around since like 1995 or so, so a uh, little over 20 years, and we've gone through a lot of growing pains um, going from different security models and to into where we are now. So to do that, I'm just gonna kind of start where we started from relating to roles and security, moving into where we are today and kind of where our mindsets are and then where we really want to be and get to in terms of security. Um, so for some background, in the beginning, roles just controlled everything within the system. So again, we are a full solution for manufacturers and we built everything for them. This includes, again, their, their HR system, their, their in-out system, everything that they need to do, they would log into our system and they would use us full stop. Um, this also means that early on, we as a company also used everything within the system. So maybe not the greatest idea because we're a software company, not a manufacturing uh, company, but um, that also means that everything that you needed to do in that system was role-based. If you needed to log in uh, to, to check in, if you needed to do any action with the system, there was gonna be a role for that. And honestly, it looked a lot more like permissions more so than roles. Um, we had a lot of them. Um, and even again, we put our deployment system in here, we put everything you needed to do in the system. Um, and so, in a way, for us, roles were a way of assigning responsibility. If, if you were given a role, that was kind of your wheelhouse of what, of what you had to do. Uh, so, so for example, we have this idea of, of a module champion. You can think of a module as just an area of the system, right? You have an accounting module champion. They are responsible for the entire stack in that area. And I pulled the definition from our internal wiki, which again, we also built. And it's essentially saying it's an individual developer responsible for that module. And so this means if a feature request came in, that's on you. If something went down, that's on you. Um, and so this was a pretty good approach to start, but as we grew, it's just you can't handle all that information. Um, but there's a slight problem with that is that we also had this idea of a standards member and they were responsible for our language standards. You can think of this as where the braces go in JavaScript or tabs or spaces. Um, but they were also responsible for deploying restricted source code. And we defined restricted source code as really any code that we felt could negatively impact the system in a large way. So for example, um, the, the menu system, that was a module. And a menu is pretty much going to be everywhere throughout your system. It's how your users navigate. So that would be a restricted, uh, restricted module that a standards member would have to deploy because they know how to deploy restricted code. But the problem with this, again, we have this very clear definition of roles, is that we have this situation where someone who owns this system, who knows everything about it, can actually deploy the change. So you have this guy on the standards team who doesn't know anything about the change itself. He doesn't know anything about why the feature came in, but it's his responsibility to deploy restricted code because again, he knows how to deploy restricted code. Roles were often a solution for us to prevent problems from happening again. So to, to put simply, if you have an employee who does a thing and that thing didn't go right, we would generally create a thing do a role. And it seems a little extreme, but that's kind of how things evolved. 
if, if an, we would give employees a lot of privileges because we trust them, and in the event that they didn't uh, do something right, maybe it's their own fault or not, we would all get into a room and we'd be like, hey, how can we solve this problem? How can we make sure that this thing doesn't happen again? And you would, we'd all be like, boom, that guy. Like, he's, he is now the thing doer. It is your responsibility to make sure that, that thing doesn't ever happen again. And so this created a lot of problems, um, again, as the company grew and grew and grew, where simple tasks would just involve multiple, multiple people. So true story, we have a, a developer who, who simply just, they asked the, the network engineer for a new domain. This is it's an internal domain. It's going to be within inside our four walls. He's just asking, hey, I, I need to get this made. Um, we are using Azure, so in this case, he needs to create a resource group. Resource groups in Azure are kind of where you put all the resources. It's responsible for, for billing, and you can put some more restrictions on it. But because a resource group isn't a networking concern, the network engineer cannot create resource groups. So he has to go over to the system engineer and be like, okay, yeah, sure, yep, I'm gonna create one for you. Comes back, all set, um, realizes, hey, this is a .dev domain, HTTPS, like, can I make a cert? So he asks the engineering managers, who's responsible for approving these types of requests. Um, he's like, yeah, sure, I guess, cool. Um, domain gets added, and then this comes back to me the developer. Um, and so what to realize here is that you know, all these steps take time. Um, maybe you'll get lucky and it's instant if they just got nothing going on. Uh, it could take a day. Uh, it could be a week if that individual in that role just isn't there. So a very simple task, I mean, to put it in perspective, this should have taken a couple minutes to go to log into Azure, add some resources, and when we're, when we're good to go, it took like two weeks which is, again, it's a very sad story. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so one thing that I'd really like to, to kind of uh, highlight, especially to, to newer devs or just when people are complaining at the company or even to everyone else, right, is like these were probably the right choices at the time. I mean, again, the company's been around for a really long time. Um, I have a paycheck because of these decisions. We are thriving because of these decisions. But you know, there comes a time where you actually do need to change and need to evolve. So when, you, when you're working on like a legacy system, and you're like, how did they ever make these decisions? Why would they ever, ever do this? I mean, there's a lot of factors back in the day that create these types of decisions. So that's kind of a, a look into what we, what we did back then. Um, you know, still a little bit today, but for the most part, we have a very different mindset. So at the heart of it, it's automatic approvals through policy. So think of it as we had that previous slide where we have to go through every single individual step, and those are pretty much all approvals. But we do this because policy really enforces what we actually care about. And this was really, I feel, a, a green light, a, a light bulb for us when we really started looking into policy as to how to secure our resources, where you don't really necessarily need an individual to, to stand these concerns up, if you, like uh, a virtual machine or a repository or any, any sort of thing that you might want to request. Um, when you ask for those, the person in charge of that is just going to make sure that the, the constraints are within reason. You're not asking for a ton of resources. Maybe it's named correctly. You know, whatever they care about in terms of like their domain, that's what they're looking for. And if it meets all the criteria, they're just probably going to do it for you. So to, to kind of tackle this problem, uh, it all starts with OPA for us, Open Policy Agent. Um, if you're not familiar, you can really think of it as a yes-no engine for the most part. You give it a, uh, you give it some data, and then you have uh, rego files, which are your policies. And then, given those those two, it will say, like, can you do this or can you not do this? And so as an example, uh, this is a really simple uh, rego query to kind of show you how uh, a po policy might look. This is a Kubernetes manifest for, uh, for a namespace. And this is saying if input.kind is namespace and there does not exist a labels uh, field, then it, sh it, should it should deny and say namespaces must have labels. 
So one of the really powerful things about, about Rego is that it doesn't necessarily care about the, the, the structure of the data coming in. That's something that you define. So input here is in blue because that is a keyword. It's the input to Rego. But you know, kind is just something that, that we set because that is what is in a Kubernetes manifest. You have kind operations, but you also have metadata, you have labels. But anything to the right can really be anything. Um, and so in our case of creating a namespace, you can say, here's this manifest. It's a namespace. Does it have a label? Yes or no? And so to, to use all these tools together, uh, we use something called, uh, called CompTest. And the, the power of, of this tool for us when we were introduced to it was the fact that it supports just a wide range of file formats. So to really kind of showcase what can happen with files, you have YAML, JSON, INI, um, and, and Docker files, for example. And so we can take any sort of structured data where we know what the data is going to look like, throw it at CompTest. CompTest has our policies in it, and it can tell us, does this file violate our policies. So a really simple pipeline could be that a developer is going to submit a pull request, and that pull request is going to contain their Terraform, it's going to contain their Kubernetes resources, and then when they submit it, ComTest itself will validate the PR. Um, the key thing to note here and to really highlight, again, maintainers define their policies because, again, Policies are really just a brain dump for what the maintainer wants. The maintainer, the person who might have had that role, is the person creating these policies. So as a developer, I contribute to your, to your repository. I must abide by your policies. And then if it validates, then you're just you're off to the races. Because if you are within spec, everything's named correctly, you have all the right labels, et cetera, it's just going to go off and do it. In this case, you know, a, lot of our, a lot of our implementations are using Terraform, so we can just say, hey, this is valid Terraform, do a Terraform apply, good to go. Um, so again, to really showcase some of the other use cases that you can have for this that, that we do, um, talked a lot about Terraform. We have a means for if a developer wants a repository in Azure DevOps, we don't have an Azure DevOps guy um, creating repositories anymore, we used to, but now that's all automated where the, the DevOps guys wrote a Terraform source module, so they define how they want their repositories to look. And so when you request a new one, we just have to make sure to say, hey, are you using the Plex source module for this, for this repository? The, the other use cases, again, because it doesn't really matter what the input is, we have Kubernetes manifests that say you have to have these labels, and also, again, Docker files, you can make sure that uh, it has a label for origin. Some other examples could be the Docker file has to come from blessed images. So if you at your company have only images that, that you allow your employees to use, you can make sure that like, the from tag is actually from a list of approved images. Um, super, super powerful. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the tool itself, um, this talk just like blew my mind when it came to, came to uh, policy agent and comp test because we were working through this like, just at this moment when I believe you know, that this talk came out where we were, we were thinking, we knew we wanted to apply policy, especially at the, at the Kubernetes level. We knew that we wanted to make sure that our policies, or, um, our YAML files had uh, spe specified labels on them, but we were really f afraid of the fact that how would we put this to the left, shift it to the left for our developers because we didn't really like the idea of developers writing, writing code, writing manifests, and then they didn't know if it was actually going to violate spec until it actually went to the cluster. Um, and we were really afraid of that, but ComTest, again, it can be run on your local, because it's just a binary. It can be run in your CI CD pipelines. Um, and then once it's deployed, that's kind of where the wheelhouse for, for ComTest ends. Um, the other approach we are taking is not only the creation of resources, but also the configuration of those resources once they're already created. So this is actually pretty, pretty new for us. Um, we are doing repository uh, policies through a policies.yaml file where we can say, 
uh, in the root of your repository. These are the things that I want set. So you don't really need any sort of extra, extra permission aside from being able to contribute to your repository. Um, and once you make these changes, we have an Azure function that was basically monitoring for pushes to policies.yaml. It will notice, say, hey, did, did anything change? And if it did, uh, validate against our ops team's set policies. Even if it doesn't, then we can go ahead and you can modify that repository. So it's end-to-end, -end essentially, of you can create this repository, and then once it's up and running, you can still make changes to it. You don't need to say, hey, yes, we, we, we got this repository, but now we need to make a change to it. Can you update this value for me? We, we can all do it through here. Because again, we used to have to say, hey, uh, we used to have two approvers, but now we want three, and that's gonna be, you know, so we, so we use service now, it's gonna be a service now ticket. Like, update this number from two to three. That's just not a good use of someone's time. The, the last thing for, for policy that we're really um, starting to get into is, is a tool called uh, Gatekeeper. Um, and this is, this essentially picks up where comp test uh, stopped. So again, we use comp test for everything for like local and CICD. And then Gatekeeper is responsible for enforcing those like in the cluster themselves. This is what we were gonna use for um, the actual application of the policies. And we didn't know what to do with the, the CICD part until comp test, but this, is allowing you to use the same policies because both tools are built off OPA and built off Rego. Again, Rego doesn't really care um, what the data is. OPA just reads it, so you can shove any kind of data and you can use the same policies wherever. Because again, policies might change from environment to environment and you can configure that, but for the most part, if you say that you don't want a label or you need a label somewhere, um, you shouldn't have to rewrite that policy for, for everything. You shouldn't have to deploy this to the gatekeeper and deploy this to comp test. You can have a central policy location that, has, that, that, that defines all of your policies. Um, and kind of to the point of like, it doesn't make sense for someone to do this, the, the thing that really resonates for me is that a big, another big push of this is again, we, we want employees to, to, to innovate and not just approve requests, right? We, these individuals are incredibly smart, we, we pay them well, and we shouldn't have to take away their time just to approve requests, right? They're, they're, they're working on highly complex things, they, they see a, a list come in and an email saying, hey, you need to approve this, they probably don't really want to, they wanna be off doing this thing, but if they don't approve it, it slows everybody down. Um, so with this type of approach, we can just make it so we remove that load from them and they're able to do what they actually want to do. Um, I like to call, the, I'll call this out too because again, it's not like roles are dead and, pol and policy is everything. For, for us, it was really just a different way of thinking about security. Um, again, early, early days was we would implement a feature and we would say, okay, well, this is new. Now we have to add some role for that. You know, the, the thing doer, this thing has to be protected and who's gonna do this? Um, and just everything was very locked down from the get-go. Whereas now we take very much the approach of like, why can't we open this up? Why can't we open this up to everybody? What are the things that we actually care about? Um, and then take it from there. And again, policy can use roles. I mean, it's, it can be very possible that you have someone who is a Kubernetes operator and that's a role, and you have a policy saying that you must be in the Kubernetes operator role and you must have, have these fields on your YAML. Um, they can work together. So, so for going forward, um, the, the easy bit of it is that we just really want to continue adopting policy. We wanna make sure that, um, that we are trying to remove manual sign-off and just implement policy where we can. For me, the, the more interesting part and where we're gonna be spending the most of our time, I believe, going forward, is actually moving those policies into the application level. Um, and so what I, what I mean by that is, not only do we have this role problem internally here um, at our company, but since both systems are pretty much the same, that our customers also feel this, like they have a lot of roles that they have to manage because our system is meant to run their business and every business has different policies, different security rules. And so we give them the ability to 
um, to define how their business works. But really the only way we have to do that is to say, hey, like you can create roles um, and then we have to check all those in our system. So it would be really, really cool if we can say, uh, these are your policies. You can kind of um, define those how you want them to be. And maybe we could even set our own global policies, if you will, of like, this is how typically manufacturers solve this problem. But if you want to make modifications to it, then you're more than welcome to, uh, to write your own policies and get them out of this, this very, very role heavy world. Um, so that's all I had. Uh, these are all the, the, the links to the tooling that I introduced. Um, OPA, Comtest, Gatekeeper, and then Garris talk on Comtest. Um, thank you so much. I'm gonna be here all week. Um, we have time for questions now. Otherwise- We do. Okay. All right. How do you, how do you address like emergencies? For Emer example, Emer emergencies within the, within the people needing to make uh, like a manufacturer, say something comes up that is unscripted, that isn't like an SO, something out of the. You're I cutting out a lot. I'm really sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you how do you identify? How do you adjust for like an emergency? Something that wouldn't necessarily fit like an SOP style policy. Okay. How how quickly adjust for those those emergency changes? So like if you need to make a change that would like violate policy? Yes. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there, there's obviously always going to be like we overrides. I mean, we, this, is our, this is our typical CICD pipeline. The, the individuals in these roles still have full, full access. Again, the, so much of it, again, is the maintainers defining their policy. So if you, essentially, if you are a contributor, someone who is trying to contribute to the repository, well then just it's policy full stop. But you as a maintainer, you as someone who, who has, you know, you, you can push to master, um, you will still have those permissions. So if anything came up, like you still have the ability to, to violate policy, um, which is actually another really cool thing about, um, about Gatekeeper specifically is that in even the previous talks on continuous compliance, that if that ever happens, um, we are actually looking into ways of running continuous compliance and making sure that no one did just go run cube cuddle, add some things and um, change configurations manually because we wanna be aware of those, of those um, changes, but, but yeah. For, for the most part, yeah, they still have permission to do that. Other questions? Yeah. How did you go about adding the new requirement now that uh, I, Rego itself, um, new learning experience, yep. adding that load? Um, how did that slowly? Now it's, it's practice. Yeah, so I mean, for, for us, it was, I mean, it was very slow, a few people. Um, it was definitely not an, an overnight thing. I mean, these are, these are approaches that you can take at a, a team by team level or even like a repository by repository level. So, so for example, the, the first thing that we ever did was just a policy around our Docker files because we, we have a policy that Docker files must have an origin, uh, an origin label. And so the owners of that repository said, okay, I'm going to add comp test into my CICD pipeline. I'm going to write a policy folder that says that and we're good, right? And then that just kind of naturally evolves and grows throughout the system. Um, and then even now, I mean, it's like we are, as more and more repositories are created, we are just leveraging this tool more and more as we, as we naturally grow. There's not like a hard requirement that thou must do this. Um, we, we see it as a way to allow you to not have to do this manually. So again, it's not, it's not a company requirement, but um, if it's appealing to, to the end user, to the, to the maintainer, which I would hope it would be, they, they can implement it. Other questions? Got time for at least one more. Yes, this is uh, in reference to your repository policy. Can you elaborate on how do you guys make decisions uh, when to update the repository based on your policy. So say you're expecting a three, but they put a two, uh, but in the situations where it's not simply, it could be a range of values. How do you guys come to that decision to decide how to update that value? Um, so I mean, in, in that use case, that was definitely, 
that's up to the team um, from like approving from two to three, for example, I think you were saying? Yeah, but in a, that's a very simple case, but like ranges. Right. So they put it in two, but how do you know it was supposed to be a three if there's range one through five? How did you guys go through that process? Sure. I mean, so yeah, I, I think the best way to put it is that it's, it's up to the team. I mean, we can have, you, if you have a really simple um, project that a team is responsible for, they can say, hey, this project we don't really care about. You know, it's, it's internal, it's used you know, in very small areas. That's just going to be one. Whereas this is, we as a team, we own this really critical piece of software. Um, we think it should be five or, or, or some number, right? The, for us and kind of the, the whole um, takeaway for this is it allows teams to conf make, make those choices and configure it how they want without bringing in the, the actual owner of the overall platform. So I mean, in this case, Azure. Um, so I mean, I don't know how like they would have made that decision um, from, I know from uh, my perspective for, uh, on these types of projects that yeah, if, if we feel that something needs two, we say it's two. Otherwise, it's just going to be one or three or whatever the team decides to do. All right, thank you very much. Big round of applause. Thank you.